Mimi, Jana Shalom, Bungie at the Go, and the Tap, and the Fort Morrison, and the Jibika, and the National. I speak Ojibwe because that is a cultural shock to people. And uh, oftentimes, in order to decolonize um, our lives or our workspace, we have to go through some culture shock. So I wanted to greet you with a handshake from my heart and a traditional custom. I'm really excited to be here today. I wanted to give a shout out to Deanna um, uh, for connecting me with the B-Corp folks. And you all do some really amazing things. I feel like I need to hit up a design week. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> but I'm really, really excited. Oh, I realized I need a clicker. And it's also my birthday, so you have to like my presentation. <laughs> my partner was like, can I take you to lunch for your birthday? And I was like, no, but you can go to my presentation. <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. Uh, I predominantly come from the nonprofit sector. I have about 15 years experience in immigration, refugee rights, LGBTQ justice, um, and really looking at racial justice and equity lens from the social justice movement. Um, but then um, I've also helped a lot of organizations uh, through their DEI journey as a consultant. Um, I had an opportunity to, for example, train all the new season staff. Um, I had an opportunity to work with the Oregon Food Bank to launch their equity journey. And currently I'm at Prosper Portland as the diversity, equity, inclusion manager there. So um, it's uh, kind of wearing two hats, a lot of different hats today. Um, Prosper Portland is also on a journey of DEI. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the ways that we can maybe provide some resources. Um, I'm also a community activist. Um, one of the uh, logos I have here is um, from a Two-Spirit Nation, which is a nonprofit I'm a part of, um, one that went to Standing Rock for six months. Um, and that was a really informative uh, part of my journey as a human being and as an um, Ojibwe woman to be a part of, and then as a Two-Spirit person. So as a Two-Spirit um, it's a, kind of an umbrella English term since there's over 580 tribes. <laughs> We're like, what do we call ourselves? But the concept is around uh, being blessed with both feminine and masculine um, features and characteristics. It's uh, another term for like LGBTQ Native American. It has a lot of different meanings. It's also um, a role within your community. So it's not just a sexual orientation. Um, so we launched a Two-Spirit Nation at Standing Rock which was um, a movement within a movement to not only decolonize um, homophobia, but also to fight for the protection of water. So I wanted to kind of uh, let you know who I am and what, what perspective I bring to this work. Um, and I, I think the other thing I'll mention is, you know, I've had the opportunity to both work for the governor, Kate Brown, and I've also um, been homeless, you know, and for me, um, having a lot of different identities and, and parts of my life allow me to kind of talk between the cubicle and the community. Um, I'm also pretty ethically ambiguous. Um, I'm a tribally enrolled member, but I'm, I have light skin privilege. And so being so ambiguous kind of helps me to talk to a lot of different people about this kind of work. So that's a little bit about me. So my colleagues over at Prosper Portland have put together some facts that I wanted to share with you. Obviously, there's a deep interest in this room. Um, and just hearing from you all, the room's packed, so that's great. Equity is a hot topic, um, and I probably don't need to convince you why this is so important, but I did want to talk through some of the facts. So raise your hand if you hear the story, uh, Portland's so white. Okay, so pretty much everyone raised their hand. Um, so Portland can feel really white, <laughs> and it um, was a hotbed of white supremacy activity. Um, if you look in our, our state's history, um, Portland was identified as kind of this white utopia, and for sure there are a ton of white folks in Portland. But also I wanted to let folks know that right now about 47% of our high schoolers identify as students of color, and one in five people in Portland are foreign born. So we want to kind of make sure to honor um, the narrative of the communities of color that live here in Portland, and to, to honor the demographics that are going to continue to shift, um, not just in Oregon, but across the country. We also see um, a, a huge drop in turnover for those who are deeply connected to the company, giving and volunteer efforts. Um, that's why you all are B Corp people, because you know that um, when you show up to work, it's not just, you're not just an employee. You have uh, an identity and a soul and a spirit and you know, a heart and things that you care about. And really the merging of your identity in the workplace can be really, really important so that people don't have to check their identities at the door or their interests at the door when they go to work. We see a higher revenue, 30%, generated per employee for companies with inclusive talent practices. And we see an increase in earning uh, for folks of color 
Um, the disparity here on the right is that right now we're not keeping track with um, the rate of um, for profits for communities of color. So for employees of color, they're earning much less than, for example, folks in San Francisco who have a 61% higher earning for folks of color. It's probably not a surprise um, due to racism. You know, we see a uh, lack of earnings for folks of color. And this is actually coming from a wealth perspective. So this isn't even talking about the poverty rates. So there is an employment crisis for black folks in Portland, for trans folks, for people with disabilities um, that we're seeing. So this is actually coming from a wealth perspective, not even really getting into some of the poverty issues that we're seeing. Um, this is also some text that you'll see on our um, page over at Crossford Portland. We're launching a program called Portland Needs Progress. Um, and it's not to compete with the core by any means, but I just kind of wanted to honor the few different hats um, that I'm wearing. But we're hoping that um, companies will engage in similar activities that you all are doing. So encouraging folks to do culture change work, um, encourage them to pay a fair wage, um, encourage them to buy from um, business owners of color, um, and encouraging them to invest in youth of color here in Portland. So we have our, our web page here. Um, and you know, our, our knowing is that there's 32,000 businesses in Portland. Imagine if everyone was as engaged as you are. Um, I was taught though that there's three uh, reasons that people need to do equity work. And I find that only talking about one doesn't help <laughs> because there's lots of reasons that we all get involved in this work. So from a personal level, um, a lot of us uh, know that this work is really personally engaging to us, and we know that our employees will be more satisfied, and will be more connected. There's a ton of professional reasons to have uh, folks working together in a way um, that's real and authentic and building culture change work and partnerships. But there's also a moral reason, um, and sometimes we forget to talk about that. Sometimes we just wake up in the morning, we know it's the right thing to do. And to ask people to not talk about those values in the workplace can really um, fragment the reasons that people do equity. Can I just see a raise of hands? I want you to think about the main reason that you want to do equity work. Um, I know you want to do all three, and I certainly do too, but if you had to kind of land on one for your personality. Let's uh, have folks raise their hands if it's for personal reasons. Okay, cool. And let's see professional. And then let's see moral. Wow, so most of the room put up their hand for moral reasons. And I just want to note that often we're taught because of white supremacy not to be able to talk about politics, right? We're not be able to talk about sensitive issues. Um, when really, there, we all have moral reasons when we look around in the country or in our personal lives that acne work is crucially important right now. So, and has always been and always will be. So, I just don't want you all to feel fearful that you can't talk about those things at work. So, I promised some nuts and bolts. Um, I'm only one of many equity practitioners. Um, I think I even heard a few other folks maybe in the room who do this work. There's, you know, 860 different models of change. <laughs> so, you could go to Uncle Bob's diversity training and it might look really different than the way that I might talk about it. Um, I certainly don't want to prescribe any right way to do things. This is just my offerings to you today during the lunch period. I'm like Seth my birthday, so you have to like it. <laughs> so I wanted to give you kind of an appetizer of some of the topics that you might expect. Um, there's a bulb out, so this is really hard to read. Um, certainly isn't accessible, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to kind of give you a flavoring of some of the topics that you might expect to talk about. Something that might be a little bit uncomfortable for you or your employees, right? Um, so we're gonna go through just two quick examples today of some of the things that are really important to talk about if you're going to do culture change work. Right here we see an iceberg concept of culture. So on the top, you see things like arts, music, dance, literature, folk dancing. <laughs> Sometimes we think of culture as this like thing where you wear a costume or um, you know your, your regalia, or, you know, and there's this really like just not accurate image of what culture can mean. But below the iceberg, and there's a lot of iceberg metaphors, so I apologize, um, but below the iceberg are a lot of different um, concepts of culture that really, really inform how you run your business and how you treat your customers and how you make your investments. One concept of culture is 
facial expressions, um, definition of success, conception of uh, justice, incentive to work, um, rules of descent, cosmology, your arrangement of your physical space, social interaction rate, notions of adolescence, ordering of time. So when you're asking employees or customers to engage in your space and your business, they're bringing with them a ton of different backgrounds uh, based on their culture, how they grew up, what kind of um, economic class they came from, what their racial or ethnic identity is, what their gender identity is, sexual orientation. So uh, a lot of these things are really kind of hidden under the, the surface of the water. And I wanted you to uh, think about this concept for a second, and I want you to actually engage with someone next to you to ask the question, what elements of culture impact your approach to work? So just for two minutes each, I want you to engage in that conversation with someone next to you. Just realizing that how you approach people are also being like, I don't know her. 
going in and not even stopping to think of other people and whatever it's going to be. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking about, like that forcing myself on them. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, communication is so subtle, but you know, um, maybe for like two or three years, a colleague just doesn't feel like they belong in that workplace. You know, they just can't put their finger on it, but it's just kind of the feel they get, right? These are the kind of subtleties that are really important to talk about around culture. Can someone else? You see a hand? No scratch? I'm gonna ask for one more volunteer, all right. Get more steps in. <laughs> So one of the things I was thinking about and talked about is how I have a very diverse workplace and last week I had an opportunity to meet with one of the other Latino people at my company and me and her had the most efficient meeting ever because all the shorthand that we could use to each other was just so, it was there and I realized that um, because we shared a reference point, we made things a lot more, a lot faster in our meeting and that investing in Cultural diversity means investing literal time in having conversations that are not shorthand. For sure. I really appreciate yeah. that. One of the things that people ask me for is like a flow chart or a book on culture. Because <laughs> white supremacy and dominant culture is like, oh, if I look up on page 47 <laughs> how Latinx people talk about things, then I'll know exactly how to be the perfect boss. Um, and it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> so, one of the things I encourage people to do is have a, cult, a concept of cultural curiosity, which means what, what things are people bringing with them in the room when they come as a customer, as a colleague, right? Um, and to have conversations to just understand that there's a lot of things that people might not be able to put their finger on that just kind of seem different, right? And that's their cultural um, background. So sorry, no flow charts today. Another iceberg, <laughs> so careful on your boat. Um, <laughs> is the concept of levels of racism. And for those of you who've been through a lot of culture change work or journeys, this is probably really familiar, but that racism um, kind of was seen as this really overt thing. And it certainly is still overt. Um, whether it's hate crimes, bless you. Uh, not seeing um, folks in office, racial slurs, um, folks getting called the cops on for having barbecues is definitely still overt. Um, but we also see other levels of racism that are sometimes harder for companies to really identify. And that's that there's something happening on the cultural level, like I'm talking about with the last iceberg. So dominant culture says, you know what? We're gonna have obsession over the written word. <laughs> and we're gonna be on time, and there's gonna be no flexibility, and you can't take care of your kids today, and all these other things. You can't be who you are, you can't wear snow, I hate sleeves, and I can't wear, I have to wear sleeves to work, because there's this dominant culture concept that like, if I don't have sleeves and I have tattoos, I'm less professional. So um, as soon as I get home, I take off the sleeves. But that's the kind of cultural iceberg, which is that there's this dominant culture of the way you're supposed to be a successful person. Then you see it playing out at an institutional level. So name some institutions for me. Places of power within our society. Just shout them out. Banks. Totally. Yep. Yep. Okay, so you guys went to some equity trainings. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so banks, hospitals, our legislative system. One can even talk about the institution of family, and what family, concept of family is. But we, we certainly know that our, our laws and policies and healthcare system and banks and um, media are, are places where the institution is not being exclusive, inclusive, and so it's continued to exclude and oppress um, underrepresented communities. And then if you bake them all together, um, it's this horrible uh, thing called structural racism, which is the way that those things are existing and how they're existing interchangeably. So we're all kind of swimming in the same sea, right? We're all fishies in this, in this ocean. And it's not to say that this is a search for the guilty or that you were born wrong if you're a white person. Um, it's really to make sure that we are aware of the sea that we're swimming. Right? To call it out and to engage in each other in a respectful way. So let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can um, approach culture change work. Before, um, well, actually, I'd like to kind of get a sense from the room. Um, if, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you're in three different kind of places of culture change work. One is like, this is my first culture change anything, and we're brand new. 
The, the second one would be like, we're, we're really kind of in the thick of it. Uh, we just start, we have some foundation. And the third place would be, uh, we're experts and we ended racism yesterday. So, uh, <laughs> so if you're in place number one, can I see a hand? Just kind of new beginners. Okay, place two. Okay, and no one ended racism, so that's a trick. <laughs> so, um, so some of these might ring true to you. Um, I certainly will kind of breeze through uh, some of these things, and then we can definitely have some Q and A if you feel like you need an advanced round. Um, but I definitely think it's important for people to both think of the risks and the benefits to this work. Um, so the benefits, like we talked about, you're going to be more strategic. Um, you're going to have increased skills and awareness for staff. That kind of cultural curiosity, um, emotional intelligence is just really good across the board, you know, as an employee, as a person, as a partner, as a parent, um, and then people like engaging in those, those skill sets. Um, increased trust for um, underrepresented communities, communities of color, in working with this business. Um, increased opportunity to collaborate with other businesses that really care about your social mission and care that you're on a company journey. Um, increased opportunity to get investors uh, for those nonprofits, you know, donors that care about equity work and really want to invest in a company that is doing this. Um, and it's just very meaningful. There's a lot of camaraderie that comes with it. Um, I was with uh, the Center for Equity and Inclusion, which is a really great organization. Um, and they were working with us the other day at a training and you know it might be a simple concept they were like get together and share like how much you appreciate your colleague and we were like and it's a part of a master plan to build trust and then if you have trust you can build trust in communities of color so there's like this bigger master plan happening but the activity was so simple it's like sit down tell your colleague why you care about them and why they're awesome actually Yvonne was in my group and we decided that we you know there were tears and we all decided we loved Harry Potter and now we have this <laughs> Thing, but it was probably the most meaningful part of the training, I think, and the day, and probably some of my, my greatest experience at Prosper yet. So something so simple can really create um, camaraderie in the workplace and trust. Unfortunately, <laughs> there are also some risks to DEI. I'm not saying don't do equity work, but I, do, I am saying to make sure you're doing it in a good way and that you're, you're resourcing it and you're preparing for the time and energy that it takes. Uh, one thing that can happen is if you don't have enough staff um, trained on this work, especially within your HR department, you know, there's gonna be a lot of emotions that come up <laughs> um, when you're doing this work. And a lot of people think that, um, you know, if you're a person of color, you're just kind of automatically an equity person. And that's just not true. <laughs> so um, equity skills take years and years to figure out and master. Certainly, though, um, folks of color have a lived experience that is just priceless. That, and if they're interested in that work, um, you know, they can, they can obviously be encouraged to engage in equity work. Um, but it, it's a really important thing to have a skill set there that might just not automatically be there. Um, sometimes CDI work can be bottlenecked. Um, a lot of the folks, um, if you're in a bigger business, um, you know, it's something that's so meaningful across the board that if your CEO or boss wants to be part of every decision or your equity council, things can get really bottlenecked and then you kind of launch this equity campaign and then someone's like, I haven't heard anything about equity in like a year, like what the, what the heck's going on? So you want to make sure not to bottleneck decisions um, and make sure that there's equity work happening at all. Um, there's certainly a feeling that some folks just can't do DEI work due to the nature of their role. Um, I talk to accountants all the time, <laughs> they're like, but I want to be a part of the revolution. And there's no spreadsheet that will end racism, but there is, um, there is an important um, element to making sure everyone stays involved in the workplace culture. Um, and we definitely are talking to folks about procurement, um, ways that our budget is accessible to the community, you know, do people understand how to get a parking reimbursement, because those can be elements of diversity, too. Um, there's definitely a deep-rooted fear and refusal for some folks to examine their personal bias. Um, culture change work can really lose some employees, right? Because maybe they were hired 10 years ago, and you didn't have that heart-to-heart, -heart, and you didn't set the standard for uh, having a care and value around DEI work. 
So, um, you know, I worked with the um, CEO at the food bank, and we were, we were doing an internal launch on equity. And I recommended to her to kind of say, look, like this is the shit now. So if you're not down with equity, like start looking for another job, right? And we'll give you some time, like we'll give you a few years, but like in the end of the day, this is where we're headed, right? So that was a really powerful moment, um, but it's a really important conversation to think about. There are definitely some employees that might be on their way to retirement and just like feel like they don't want to do this work, right? So how are you going to have a plan around that? Um, a surface level of commitment, um, which means it looks good, it feels good. Uh, we're gonna have lots of folks of color all the time, everywhere. Uh -huh. But then when it comes to a real power shift, really shifting the power in the organization to center people who haven't been centered historically in the United States, that's when the rubber hits the road. Um, so it's really important that there's an investment from the top to do things different and to engage in the real culture change work. If you don't have your boss or your ED at the table, it's not gonna be very successful. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes you have to just um, focus on not getting stuck in that interpersonal layer of racism. Um, it's really important to think about interpersonal dynamics when you're doing this work, but you also have to look at the systemic ways that your policies or your business might be structured around dominant culture. Um, so a lot of people think this work happens just on like, oh, I'm good, we're good, right? We've done the work, um, but really looking at your business policies and the way that the public experiences your space. So those are some risks. Well, that didn't uh, format well, but <laughs> you can see I'm going on a trajectory here. So I wanted to list out some activities that you can expect to kind of scale up your DEI work. So you might be on the considering level. I'm considering DEI work. I'm considering culture change work. Um, I want to learn more about it. So you're at the right lunch. Um, the second step, though, I don't know what kind of structure you all have, but are you engaging your top decision makers, perhaps your board, um, around culture change work? And then you um, engage your staff. So how many of you guys, raise your hand if you um, talk about racism in the workplace? Okay, so not every hand is raised, right? Um, raise your hand if you have a policy on racism in the workplace. Okay, I see some more hands. Raise your hand if you have a public statement about racism. Okay, less hands. So these are kind of the um, second few steps. Is are you engaging your staff and board? Have you come out, so to speak, around wanting to end racism? Um, even if you don't feel like you're perfect at it yet, it's really important to let people know um, because you certainly aren't gonna get anywhere unless you're, you have your, your crew on board. Um, then you need to make sure that you're doing it with a lens geared towards folks of color, right? So if we do culture change work in a dominant bubble, all we're really doing is like tokenizing people and trying to have quick results. <laughs> Let's end racism tomorrow. We did everything right. There's a, there's a checklist um, and a lot of this work is really ambiguous. So you need to make sure that you're doing it in a way that's led by folks of color um, or, or thinking of um, the ways that folks of color experience culture change. How many of you all have an equity team? Cool. So yeah, an equity team is a great place. Uh, it's often volunteer. So if you're, if you're trying to have an equity manager, but you decide it'd be cheaper to have a group of people, <laughs> um, that's not necessarily the same thing, but it's really important that employees are engaged in this work across the board. So even if you have an equity manager, you should have an equity team um, because it, it, this isn't going to work unless people are, are bought in and guiding it, right? So it's really important to make sure you have a team that's invested um, and willing to take the time and be sure to give them stacks <laughs> and time in work um, to do this work. Then you usually want to engage in some training and shared understanding. We use some really cheesy language at Prosper Portland. Like we were taught about saying, I'm noticing this thing and I'm wondering this thing, right? I'm noticing that our meeting's going really quick, and I'm wondering the impact that that's having on people in this discussion. Um, that language might be cheesy, but until we agree on a shared language and understanding, um, we're not gonna be able to have the foundation of our house to put on the fancy equity curtains, right? So it's really important that at that point you bring in a trainer um, or someone to help you build that language. 
because I bet there's 60 different definitions of racism here. And so it's really important that your business or your team kind of have the same basic understanding of what we're talking about. Um, and then you want to make sure there's tools. So everyone learns in a different way. Um, a lot of times uh, people want a toolkit. Uh, sometimes they want a PowerPoint. Sometimes they want an interpretive dance. So just try to throw as many different tools at your employees so that when they go to the trainings, they experience it, then they come back with something to grab and not to use. Then we lead into policy change, which hopefully leads into individual impact, community impact, and structural impact of any racism. Those different iceberg things. And then you're still not done, unfortunately. <laughs> you're always going to keep learning, and you're always going to have to reanalyze. Um, something we don't do really well is celebrate those benchmarks. So that's really important um, because this is a long, long journey. So this is my last part today and I'll take questions. Um, I would just say in general, it's really important to start somewhere and do something. Um, if you have a perfectionist idea of, of getting this work done, it's not gonna happen, right? So you have to be ready to be ambiguous about it um, and to be really flexible and nimble and be a good listener. Make sure that you find some resources so that you're not like winging it. <laughs> um, and that you are actually investing in some of the work um, and training. You got just a touch of the kind of conversations that we can have um, in our equity trainings. And then you want to make sure to create safety rails for POC. Listen, if you're going to start talking about racism, the folks of color in your workplace are going to be impacted the most, right? Because what used to be a safe place, like, well, at least I'm not getting fired or no one said something racist to me. It's now like, oh, God, we're talking about racism. And then some, some stuff might come up right? Um, especially for white folks and folks with privilege, you know, there's unconscious bias that needs to be unpacked. We all have unconscious bias. We all have forms of privilege and oppression. So that stuff's going to kind of unearth itself. That's when the real conversations are happening. And you need to make sure to have like affinity groups, an HR rep, um, make sure that employees of color can kind of engage when they want to, if they're feeling burnt out about it, but don't lean on folks of color to do this work. Um, you should definitely always keep your board and staff engaged, um, be ready to learn, and again, celebrate, but never finish. So, let's go until 1 or one thirty. Okay, cool, sweet. I was like speeding up there. <laughs> I would love to get some questions um, or some initial reactions from folks. So I need some brave volunteers. Yeah. Let's get out here. Well, Mike, actually, if you're comfortable with it, you never know what kind of hearing accessibility you'll have here. Yeah. <laughs> um, regarding the shared language and definitions, um, we're working through developing our shared language and definitions for our EDI group. And today in our meeting, we were discussing as to um, how do we engage the right people to develop those definitions so they're not coming from very um, Western perspectives of defining equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I just wanted to see if you had any suggestions or experiences with that. Sure, that's a really good question. I think a lot of people are asking, like, who's my equity practitioner? Like, who's right? Um, and I think that. Well, A, there's going to still be 10 different definitions of racism, so just, you know, honoring that. Um, but yeah, I would really work with an equity practitioner um, or someone who's, like, done a lot of work. Um, again, you have employees that might, like, have actually had 10 years at school around equity or, or um, someone who, they can't just be someone who has lived experience um, necessarily, so yeah, I mean, um, I hate to say like Google, but like, you know, there, there is um, a general kind of concept out there. And the thing that frustrates people, even my mom's like, uh, what's the new gender thing now? <laughs> I'm like, mom, we've talked about this, and it's always going to change. Um, so uh, knowing that that's going to change, but there, yes, I mean, within the equity practitioner community, there's a general definition of racism. Um, it can be found on the interwebs. Um, it can be validated by an equity practitioner. Um, and no, you're not gonna get a perfect answer and that, that definition is gonna continue to evolve. I would say start somewhere um, and then get feedback, right? From professionals, from the interwebs, 
from the staff, does this definition of racism kind of sound right to us? So, but I appreciate that you're wanting to make sure it's not like this dominant culture thing. So you're gonna have to do your research on it. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, we are, I was, we were told, or you mentioned celebrating benchmarks, so yeah. I wanted to kind of address that. We were told it's important to, um, you know, measure your demographics against you know, compensation, promotion, retention, uh, but, you know, we're a small company, so that's, I guess I just wanted to know your thoughts on, you know, measurement, and where to go with that, sure. resources. That you have. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I like to measure success around activities sometimes. So like, did your equity council have a retreat? Did you have an equity training? How many equity trainings did you have? I also like to measure things around outreach and not final result. So um, when we were doing voter registration work, um, oh my gosh, it was so awkward. We wanted to register a million students of color uh, because we know that students of color are disenfranchised. Um, and so we had to train thousands of volunteers about this initiative um, called I think it's the Color of the Vote or something. And so like, like how do you stand in a field and like measure whether you're actually increasing empowerment for people of color? So we ended up measuring our tactics. How many student of color organizations did we outreach to? Um, how many times did we brief people on our campaign? So yeah, I, I think that sometimes those things are really important. Um, I was certainly in an awkward meeting where I was the only gender non-conforming person um, in a national nonprofit organization. Um, and so they did like a pie chart of like our equity. And they're like, all the men and all the women. And we're a little sliver two-spirit. I'm like, well that, I, I lean to my coworker, I was like, I wonder who that is. Um, <laughs> so it's really important that you're discreet around uh, measurements of recruitment or retention for employees of color. Um, but you can, you can celebrate like, we're caring about this now. We went to a job fair. Uh, we're, we're, it feels better here. You know, these are the activities we're doing. And then keep those metrics though, um, keep those close to leadership and HR. Like you definitely should be measuring if you're, if you're having actual results um, around recruitment and retention of folks of color, outreach to folks of color, uh, pay for folks of color, whatever your equity initiative is, uh, maybe it's partnering with more diverse farmers, like whatever the, maybe it's having minority women and emerging small business companies, you know, measure those things, but um, I wouldn't put them on pamphlets if, if they don't, if they don't feel authentic. And that's, you have to find the right line there. If, if you're tokenizing and you're like, yay. Hey. Um, but it's okay to be accountable in a board meeting and be like, yes, like um, the rubber hit the road. We had another rule that said in our candidate pool, we had to have at least 50% POC candidates. So it, it kind of created a threshold where the folks we were finalizing our choice with were at least a, a room of half people of color, but we weren't tokenizing a person of color for the job. And we didn't um, uh, have a victory if the person of color was hired. And often that can put the person of color in a really bad spot because they were just hired because they were a person of color, right? So uh, it's important to be really thoughtful about these initiatives um, and to make sure you're holding your leadership accountable in a board meeting or if a staff member asks you have those facts and metrics but really leaning on the spirit and the activities kind of more publicly if that makes sense. Um, are there other questions? Yeah. So you, you talk about um, creating safety rails for POC and making sure they have a seat at the table um, in these discussions and being aware and conscious, but how do you, how do you do that thoughtfully without like singling people out or tokenizing people and being like, oh, well, you're the person of color, like let's make sure like you're the person that we're talking about with this because that almost feels like, it just feels like tokenizing. Sure. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any ways to approach that. Yeah, good question. So yeah, what, um, what I like to do is I like to always invite only, like invite only and never expect. So um, invite all the you know, folks of color to engage in affinity group, um, invite all folks of color to be heard, invite all folks of color to speak first on issues at the workplace, but never ever expect or ask directly, like, hey, you're, you're the person of color here, what do you think about that, right? 
Um, so I, I always go the invitation only kind of experience to say, hey, um, to our employees of color, or maybe you grab a coffee with the one employee of color, and you're like, you know, we're about to do diversity work here, and that's gonna be like, really intense. I just wanted to say our doors open. I wanted to see if there's anything that you need in this experience that we can be supportive around. Um, I wanna let you know that I don't expect you to speak on behalf of your community. Um, and even if this coffee's awkward, no worries. I just like wanted to let you know we're doing this work. And um, I don't want it to, to create a, a bad workplace for you to be engaged in this, this important work, right? So just be real, um, but never expect communities of color or employees of color to do that or to sit on your diversity committee. But there might be folks of color that really want that leadership and really do want to be heard and want to be front and center in the equity work, and that's their right. Um, and there might be folks of color that don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> you know, I talked to folks of color at Prosper um, about some of this, and there's definitely a handful that just hate our equity work and don't want to talk about it, and that's okay, right? So we can't make the same assumptions about folks of color just because of their race that they're necessary. There's an interest level there, right? Does that make sense? Any other questions, haikus? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we're working on in my community of work is that we have made decisions to engage with uh, people experiencing marginalization and invest in that. And now, um, not a lot, but some people ask me, so what are you really doing? Because it seems like your, your output has gone down. It seems like you're not getting as much as you're expected to get in terms of engagement, money, whatever, buy-in. Um, and, and I say it's because the communities I'm working with have been strategically disinvested from, and they must reinvest in them both as a matter of course. And so I'm not gonna get the same return as I am in, say, a Lake Oswego or something where there's more capacity. But that is a conversation that I'm still really happy at. Do you have, um, having done this work on a higher level, like, do you have stuff, like, information, I guess, or something? Sure. Well, thanks for the question. Um, I, I definitely feel like their equity practitioner community will validate that. So whether you need a doctor's note or <laughs> um, you know a trainer to kind of come in, I would I would kind of call your trainers in when when you're having trouble. Like find a consultant. I'd be happy to talk to your peeps um, just as a volunteer, <laughs> like to to kind of validate that. And sometimes having multiple voices or a voice in power, um, it just strategically helps. Um, for someone, for you not to be the only person saying this thing on equity, because it's so true. Um, I was at a nonprofit that wanted like 40% increase in employees of color, and we did not have a good reputation in the communities of color. And so it's like, who the heck's going to want to work for us, you know? Um, and and that and that's what I'm saying about um, uh, power shift from the top. That's the conversation you need to have with your CEO. That's if you like, this work's gonna be hard, it's gonna take a really long time, it's not gonna be metrics or results driven. For sure, we should have metrics because that holds us accountable, but a lot of them are just this like ambiguous stuff that's not going to equate to numbers that the board of directors <laughs> get to see all the time. So I would lay out a, a plan on how you're gonna restore justice or trust with that community of color over a long period of time. Um, and again, use activity benchmarks. We're gonna have tables, we're gonna have these many conversations. These are the ways that we're gonna measure building trust with communities, not necessarily did the communities show up, because that's gonna take some time for communities to show up um, if there hasn't been a, a relationship of trust. Um, and I would say you kind of hit the million dollar issue that goes on for agencies that wanna um, have a pendulum swing, so it's like, um, okay, we've been, we haven't done this work at all, or it's really trendy, we haven't done it, or, or we have a lot of white guilt about it, or dominant culture. Oh my God, hire all the people of color and pay them a million dollars, and like, you know, let's change the world overnight. Um, and that's really dominant culture approach to culture change work, and so we have to get CEOs to understand the kind of middle um, way to build trust long term. Yeah. 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 Y
I'm sorry that didn't answer your question because ultimately it's a power issue. <laughs> and so I would call in experts to validate you, bring in a posse, point to evidence um, around this. And if you certainly need some documents, I'd be happy to send you, you know, some, some language that like points to this work. It's taking a really long time. So given what, what was just said there, um, how do, do you have resources on helping to bring the whole leadership team on board and making this change for people who, who might be hesitant or, um, you know, can fit putting the how do I say this? Um, equity change, it can cost money to bring in a team. Sure. So how, how, when the results can sometimes not have the best data as we just talked about, like how do we, aside from the moral, mm -hmm. we need to morally do this, how do we really put that into the numbers and sure. want to be part of the Yeah. I hope I said that. Oh, that was great. <laughs> 400 points. Um, I don't know what they're good for, but maybe it's safe. Um, so I think that uh, one thing is um, there's a strategy there. Oh, I can't there you go. There's a strategy there, um, which is ask, 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 demand. So there's kind of like a strategy that needs to be in place, which is um, can you ask nicely? Then can you ask louder? And then can you kind of demand from employees that like this needs to happen. Um, that's just to get your leadership on board. Like there has to be a str there has to be kind of a political strategy to get your leadership on board that includes a big number of people. The other thing is there are numbers, um, and I showed a few earlier, which is like, this is huge recruitment retention. This is huge profits. This is, you know, so whatever the reason is for your CEO or your leadership, there's either a personal, professional, or moral reason to do equity work. So you kind of, you figure out what they care about, and then you ask, ask, ask demand. Uh, but the other thing I'll say is Portland needs progress, and again, not to steal like B Corps Thunder, I think both between B Corps and things like Portland needs progress, we're hoping to have a lot of language that show, is, is the case for why this is so important. And if that helps your leadership say, wow, like the mayor is asking businesses to do this, and you know, the city of Portland's doing this, and B Corps doing this, like, there are definitely um, facts that I'd be happy to get you if you want to come get my card that kind of make more of a business case for why this, this needs to happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, besides having a political strategy with your boss and then also like trying to give them carrots and there's carrots and stick method to, to getting your leadership on board with equity. The other thing I'll say is there's just something really powerful um, in like a retreat or a real heart to heart. Um, seeing, seeing your colleagues in pajamas, like, you know, is, is something that could take five years to build workplace trust. That can happen in a weekend. And I can't tell you how angry I get. Ah, oh, like, I just, there's all these trust issues. And you have one heart to heart, and like, all of a sudden everything's beautiful, and there's rainbows and kittens. And, you know, there's something about seeing your boss's kid or their partner or having a conversation about race or culture that just kind of like helps humanize it a little bit more. So, when um, equity practitioners usually try to compel leadership, they will take them on a really deep emotional dive, usually over a few days of training, um, where the board and the CEO, if, if you can just get them to sign up for a retreat with an equity practitioner, you find the right equity practitioner, I guarantee you it's gonna shift, it's gonna be that tectonic shift that you're looking for. So usually the strategy with leadership is to put them in a cabin somewhere or like have a full day training, um, where you really, you really do a deep dive, um, and that usually helps. So, did that answer your question, kind of? Yes. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Pass that back, please, thanks. You talked about having equity manager, mm -hmm. so what exactly is that? Sure. And how do they get training to qualify for that? For sure. We're a rare breed. Um, I was talking with the equity managers for all the government bureaus in Portland, and it's like a support group. <laughs> and we're like, there's like HR professionals don't know what we are, or like we're kind of like special ops, we're kind of HR. Um, there's a lot of equity practitioners that have a real lived experience. So like, um, 
as a person of color, they can just be like, I actually know a lot about equity and diversity, right? So that's certainly true. And then there's just various trainings that you go to. Um, certainly if, if people are interested in becoming an equity manager, go to as many trainings as you can. Um, CEI, Center for Equity Inclusion, offers um, courses that you can go on to be a certified facilitator. Um, and yes, yeah, yeah, Center for Equity and Inclusion. Um, and uh, you know, you just kind of build your accolades over time, getting exposed over and over again to different experts. And um, there's just something to be said for having 10 years experience talking about race, right? So if, you, if you're a budding equity manager, um, you know, practicing these kind of conversations, getting exposed to content, there's no like certified equity manager university. Um, they're all consultants, <laughs> so uh, kind of, you know, take that with a grain of salt and, and really go shopping for your equity practitioner and to learn their style. Um, I certainly have a different, you know, training style than someone else might have, but you should be seeing these basic concepts, and if you're not, then there's probably, a, if they're not talking about the history of racism or uh, cultural racism, then, then you can kind of tell some things off. So that you, sh you should kind of see these similar sort of topics come up. Um, the other thing I'll mention is we were going to post on our website for Portland Meets Progress uh, a list of equity practitioners because <laughs> we knew that the more we encourage businesses to do this work, the more they're going to be like, great, where do I get started? Um, so we brought together some equity practitioners, fellow me's, and uh, they were really concerned that if we had a directory of equity practitioners, we would be kind of endorsing one model of change, right? So what if you have an equity practitioner that like just is really bad and then they get on the directory or, or they're telling everyone racism doesn't exist or you know who the heck knows so um we're actually slowing down a little bit on that and we're going to have a cohort of businesses kind of help us inform the best most uh, best ethical way to have a directory of practitioners so hopefully we'll be coming out with some resources on portland means progress we're hoping to have equity practitioner fair we can go shopping for your equity practitioner um, and there'll be a directory because yes, this is needed in Portland. Um, and right now it's just a sea of equity practitioners. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not up here to enforce one because um, I wanna make sure to be ethical about that. Um, but certainly if you're completely lost, um, Center for Equity Inclusion, Resolution Zone Class, these are kind of some of the bigger players. Um, and then there's a lot of, uh, you know, singular equity practitioners that are their own uh, business. I'm sure folks of color and we love supporting them as well. So, does that help? Cool. There was a question over here. Yeah. That previous question was the core of my question. Um, it, because there aren't sort of uh, really clear certifications that an equity manager could acquire, sure. are there sort of benefits to uh, developing your own in-house team versus hiring uh, an outside party? Yeah, um, I would say you should always have an in-house team who cares about equity. Um, and they should be your equity team. And they're your equity superheroes and your cheerleaders. And, and they kind of help figure out how to troubleshoot equity in your business because they know the business. So you should have that whether or not you have an equity manager. I, um, an equity manager is like a full-time position. Um, a lot of people will kind of FTE it at 30%. So if they feel like an employee is skilled in that area, um, they'll often start with like 30% FTE on equity. And then usually the next big benchmark is we have a full-time person, which is a huge benchmark for our organization. The problem is that 30% FTE usually is like a mountain and avalanche of equity work. They're like, change the world. Do 47 other jobs while you're doing it. So um, that can be a good way, though, to put some footing into it. Just make sure that um, you're being really careful not to put too much work on that. Like, you're being realistic about that 30%. Maybe they're just kind of conducting equity team meetings. Um, maybe they're helping staff figure out outreach plans. You know, keep the tasks minimal um, to eventually build. I would bring in an equity manager when you're trying to have really complicated discussions around race. Um, or when you're trying to build your understanding of race, um, or if there's a problem going on, um, that kind of work is, is usually something you're exposed to for a while, you have experience in facilitating or training on. So. 
Does that help? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yvonne, I wanted to give you the floor if you just wanted to add anything. Um, Yvonne is our program manager for what we need to progress. Um, thanks, Court. This is really good because I've never actually seen you work in action. Oh, of course. Like, I already know that Court is off awesome because <laughs> she works in our team. But um, like she said, it's a, I mean, it's, it's very important that Court Leeds Burgers and the city and the mayor all slow down to reflect on how we can move forward in encouraging DEI training without prescribing. And that's really challenging. So we are super excited to work with this local group to see what is the best way to engage and also work with equity practitioners in the city and how to thoughtfully offer resources to businesses without telling them what to do. So um, we're very excited about the story and more to come. Um, we're looking to scale up in Q2 of 2020. So right now we're in the early adopter phase. And so we're working with small group businesses and hoping to um, gain insight from their experience, not only in DI work, but in um, changing their procurement practices to include more diverse businesses uh, through MercatusBDX.com. Um, and then also in engaging with work experience with our partners um, in encouraging a more diverse workforce from like high school to college and not just after that. We want to build and encourage um, a talent pool of diverse and talented youth in the city. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. I thought twice, so maybe use the mic. <laughs> Um, so, unless there's any final questions, I'm going to go ahead and let you close out and give you a few more minutes to digest your food. Thank you for being willing to listen to me all this time. Um, I have some cards available. I'm always happy to volunteer my time when I can. I'm super busy, but I'm like, I want to help you, so <laughs> I'll do what I can if you want to come grab my business card. Thank you so much for inviting me to space.